Hi everyone, Jason here from spiritualbabies.net. I joined us again for this week's Half Torah, Half Torah, and we are joined every week by someone who uh, gives us uh, time to us freely, which I'm very grateful for, Rabbi Joshua Neely. Oh, it's not just uh, given freely, it's given willingly. Enjoy it immensely. Uh, so this week we are in the Half Torah for Yitro, and you can find us in your Tanakhs in Isaiah 6, 1 through 7, 6, and then uh, 9 through 5 and 6. The, the text will be on the screen now. Um, and if you were, if you looked at last week's video, there wasn't any text for that whole video. It was just too long. I didn't have time. Apologies. <laughs> but it will be there this week. <laughs> it was crazy last week. Um, but it will be there this week. This will, this passage, won't it, will be uh, very familiar for um, a few different faith groups. It's very... Especially, actually, you know what? The beginning of this passage will be completely unfamiliar for any Christian watching, but the end of this passage will be hugely familiar for any Christian watching. Um, and so I'm looking forward to maybe um, for the first time introducing people to chapters six and seven of uh, the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. uh, we, so we're going to start in six. Oh, do you want to just maybe give us a, um, a recap of what's happened up to this point and why? Um, where um, where the prophet is when he's having this revelation? Um, well, actually, before we get to that, we should probably mention what's happening in Parashat Yitro, uh, in um, the, this particular section of the Torah, uh, and, and maybe we can get some clues to why we're going to be reading what we're reading from Isaiah. So, so Parashat Yitro is dealing with the, uh, the organization of the, the, the judicial system, um, but more famously, it's focused on the, the revelation of God at Mount Sinai. Um, the, uh, the statement of the Ten Commandments comes in this Torah portion, um, and what's uh, often referred to in formal theological terms, the theophany the occurs. That is to say, the, uh, the hearing, the, the revelation of God's presence to the entire nation of Israel. And it's really on that that uh, this is pulling up uh, from, from Isaiah, a similar experience by the prophet of what he experienced when he came into contact with God. Uh, and so those are the, the main parallels between the, the Haftarah text and the, uh, and the Mount Sinai text. But there's going to be a lot more that we have to discuss about the, 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 the different... Wow. You can edit that out, right? About the, uh, the differences and the similarities uh, between the two um, revelations that are happening here. I think diff diffularities should totally be a word. <laughs> well, you know, if Shakespeare could make up words... Why can't I? We uh, also what we're going to see in this passage are a lot of um, euphemisms and um, allegories. It's the the poetic anthropomorphism, um, not just of God but also of the the angels, is um, is very very strong in in this section of Isaiah, and it was always meant, of course, to evoke uh, or rather um, invoke within us certain feelings of, of, of majesty and of grandeur and of wonder, uh, but was never meant as a literal description of what God looks like, since there is no optical experience of God. Uh, there's no physical substance for light beams to bounce off of to then create an optical you know, uh, image in the back of the retina which gets translated to the brain. That's not what's happening in this vision. This is not Isaiah seeing something like I might see the, the computer sitting in front of me. Uh, but it is speaking in the language that once we accept it as being metaphor, we can then understand what was the message that was being conveyed by this. Why would the metaphor of a throne, why would the metaphor of a robe, why would the metaphor of six wings, why would these be powerful um, to Isaiah's initial audience um, as well as to all of us uh, today? In the year that King Isaiah died, I beheld my Lord sitting on a high and lofty throne with the skirts of his robe filling the temple. Seraphs stood in attendance on him. Each of, them, each of them had six wings, with two that covered his face, with two he covered his legs, and with two he would fly. And one would call to the other, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, his presence fills all the earth. Uh, seraph being the singular word for seraphim, I suppose in the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew would say seraphim stood. Um, okay, so uh, we've um, we've an instance here that um, the king has died. Uh, the prophets had a revelation, and he uh, feels that he's sitting 
um, in front of the king in a temple. And it's just that easy, right? <laughs> yeah, we can go home. All right, so, so one of the first questions before we get into the details of, um, of what Isaiah is describing here is how come Moses never gave us such intricate descriptions of God? Uh, why isn't that, that when we're reading through the Torah um, portion about Yitro, about um, the giving of the Ten Commandments and everything that's happening there, why doesn't Moses record his experience, which surely would have seen God more clearly and in more detail than, than Isaiah, but instead we have to wait all the way till these later prophets to start finding out how many wings the angels have and what the chair looks like and the skirts and everything. Why does Isaiah have a better picture of God than Moses? And the answer from our tradition is Isaiah doesn't have a better picture of God than Moses. In fact, it's precisely because Moses had a better picture of God, um, in quotes, picture, that he doesn't describe this sort of image um, as opposed to, to Isaiah. There, there's a teaching within um, Judaism that says that Moses saw God through uh, one lens and all the later prophets saw God through, through nine lenses. That Moses saw God through a clear lens and they saw God through a cloudy lens. But the basic idea being that, yes, they were all looking at the same thing, but Moses' clarity of perception was much greater than those who came later. Uh, not to take away from the later prophets, God forbid, um, but simply to say that if you're ranking ability to perceive God clearly, Moses blew everyone else away. Um, and that means, as uh, there's a great teaching from uh, Rabbeinu Natan um, in the, uh, the Aruf, where he says, it's kind of like a, um, a funhouse mirror, or at least what we would call in the modern world a funhouse mirror, which is that Moses saw God in a clear reflection and therefore didn't see or emphasize these other aspects of God's existence. Whereas Isaiah saw through a slightly, you know, wavy mirror, and just like a funhouse mirror might make the, uh, the feet look bigger than the head, that's how Isaiah describes it. And so the, the majesty of God was predominant in Isaiah's vision, and so, of course, that's what he um, tries to convey through the language of a throne and a massive robe and this whole notion, which is repeated in other places of Isaiah as well, uh, of God's enormous majesty as being um, a, a presence that dwarfs the entire planet. Um, and, and that just happens to be the way that Isaiah was focusing on it. Um, and again, we should not take the greater detail in his as being a greater vision than Moses's. It's simply a, it's an attempt by a prophet who sees God in a slightly less clear manner to convey with many more words and metaphors what he was seeing through his, his vision. And that, that, that's the first thing we gotta get out of the way. So every time a prophet describes God with more detail than Moses, it means they saw God with less detail than Moses. And they were doing the best they could to describe that, that cloudy experience. I, um, I often think that God um, communicates with people in a language that they understand the best. And when God does speak to, well, especially when prophets have kind of an out-of-body experience and they have this revelation that seems to encompass the whole of their consciousness, I, I, I've never read it that they just vanished off the face of the earth. Mm. I, I think that their, their conscious self has been moved to, a, to an area where God creates something for them to understand, and how he does that might be different. Like some, some children respond really well to written words, some children respond really well to music, some children respond really well to Lego bricks. And I think that... <laughs> um, and I think that... Um, the, the communication that God has with prophets and with us, he uh, uses a language and um, symbolism that we uh, will understand the best. Um, it, it, or at least we have the best chance of hoping to understand it. Um, whether or not we truly understood what we saw or truly understood the description of what another prophet saw is um, going to be debated over and over through the centuries. Um, I, I will refer anyone uh, who's watching that would really like to learn more about what prophecy is 
and, and what the experience of the prophet is and what role the prophet plays and how prophecy occurs uh, within the Jewish concept to, to read Rambam's Guide for the Perplexed. It's not an easy read. Um, it's, it's very um, steeped in philosophy, but he does an excellent job of really clarifying what the, the idea of prophecy means in Judaism uh, and what we should take away from the, the words of the prophets and, and how it happens that you have multiple prophets who are viewing the same God and yet will often describe God in different ways and, um, and, and why that is a, um, a good thing rather than a flaw. Uh, and also why a hyper-literal reading of the text is doing a disservice not just to the prophet, but doing a disservice to God himself. Okay, from four. Oh, actually, can you... Yeah, can Hold you, on, we're not, we're, not, we're not done with the yeah, details. No, I was going to say, we haven't even got to the holy, holy, holy. <laughs> yeah, that, that was just the general discussion of prophecy. Um, but let, let's get down to the details here. So we have this, this phrase in verse 3, you know, kadosh, 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 um, holy, holy, and holy, which for our... Um, our, our Jewish or people, our Jewish listeners or people who are um, frequent visitors of Jewish services will recognize very, very quickly uh, as being um, one of the key parts of, a serv of, of the service that happens daily, uh, multiple times daily, and also a quote that occurs in other parts of the service as well. It's, uh, it's repeated more than just during the Amidah. Um, so clearly there's something very special going on here with this holy, holy, holy. Now, the first answer is, of course, that the repetition of the word holy is emphasis. Um, it's, it's poetic license, that this is just a, uh, a way of saying really, really, really um, holy uh, for, for, for emphasis. But as I, I imagine many of our, our watchers are aware, um, Jewish scholarship usually doesn't stop by just saying it's emphasis. Uh, we do like to sort of explain things a bit more than that. So there have been quite a few different uh, attempts over the centuries to, uh, to give meaning to each of the holies. Um, one of the, uh, the most common is to say that holy, holy, holy is <clears throat> referring to um, the, the past, the present, and the future, that God's holiness is, uh, is unchanging, is immutable, and is eternal, um, something which is holy, W-H, different than, uh, than our own attempts at holiness. Uh, we may rise to a level of Kedusha in a moment, but we as humans usually do not stay in that state um, for very long at any given point, um, whereas God does, um, being one of the distinguishing features of God. Um, there, there's another interesting uh, translation uh, from the Targum Yonatan. Uh, the Targum Yonatan is one of the, uh, the early Aramaic translations of the Tanakh, where since many people were not fluent in Hebrew anymore um, and might misunderstand things, um, the Targum Yonatan put it into Aramaic, which was a more common um, lingua franca and a sister language to Hebrew. And when he translates this section, he sort of explains that each holy means a slightly different thing. He says that it is um, that God is holy um, is referring to the, uh, the upper realm, uh, meaning where uh, the, the realm of existence of the, uh, the non-corporeal, the angels and, and, and souls um, in that realm. And that God is also considered holy in the, um, the mid-realm, that is to say the, the realm beyond the physical earth, but still within the, uh, the, 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 the broader physical universe, the realm of the stars, the planets, uh, etc. And then holy for the final is, of course, referring to the earthly world, uh, the material um, existence where we live. And that last one's very important if you know anything about the, the philosophical debates uh, of the, uh, the dark and Middle Ages and even into the Renaissance, which often function or, or often rotated around the question of if God's so holy, how can he stand to be near us? Um, that if God is perfect, if God is immutable, if God is um, this, this transcendental force of holiness that uh, far exceeds and, and surpasses our universe, then what's he doing slumming with us? Uh, or indeed, as some of the philosophers argued, how could God have a connection to us if he is so perfect? And what the Targum Yonatan is saying, echoing many other Jewish teachings, is that absolutely God's holiness is, is not merely for the other realms. God's holiness um, pervades, permeates, and has a palpable impact uh, on our life and our world as well. 
When we read um, the Lord of Hosts, what's the Jewish understanding of the word hosts? So tzivaot, which is the, the word for hosts in this case, is a word that's also used for, for legions in the sense of uh, a great number or many uh, things. Uh, so the, the term tzivaot is often used in a military capacity, um, the same way that hosts used to be used in English in that same way. Um, you know, there was a, a, a host of, um, of Huns sweeping across the plains. Um, no one talks like that now, but we used to, and King James, as you mentioned, sort of uh, set things in stone when it came to Bible, even though other language changed. So really what it's describing here is the notion that God is the Lord of um, the heavenly host, which is referring simultaneously to the, uh, the angelic host, um, the angelic legions, and also the stellar legions. Um, Tzivaot is often a, um, uh, a word that's referring to the, the heavens above, the, the myriad of stars, um, which were representative of God's law and, um, and grandeur, um, that they behaved according to God's will, because the stars knew their place, um, unlike <clears throat> we humans. Um, and then it serves as a bit of a counterpoint to the next line. His presence fills all the earth. That God is not only the Lord of the heaven and the spiritual, but God's presence is also uh, in the earth as well. The doorposts would shake at the sound of the one who called, and the house kept filling with smoke. I cried, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my own eyes have beheld the King, Lord of Hosts. You kind of, wouldn't you, uh, you'd be, Woo! I've seen the King, the Lord of Hosts. Is, is this because of, uh, you know, if you, if you see um, the man who sees God, it's the man who will die? Uh, very much. And, you know, that's, that's a phrase that's, that's often misunderstood. Um, but you have to sort of imagine it that if you were to go to see the, uh, the, the king, you would probably put on your finery and your best clothes and uh, prepare yourself and take a bath for a day and a half to, to get all the dirt off of you. And when you finally stand in the king's palace, if the king throws a, uh, a black light, you know, a UV light, you're probably going to see that in the light of the king, there's a lot of other schmutz on you, to use the, uh, the wonderful Yiddish term, that you didn't notice. And you'll suddenly realize, how, how could I have stood before the king with all this schmutz? And, and that's what Isaiah is going through. That's what all the people who have a vision of God seem to go through, which is this... I thought I understood, I thought I was ready, but when I stand now fully understanding and aware of the presence of God and, and that light shines on me, I, I'm noticing all of my, my flaws, my failings, and my inadequacies in a way that I never did before. And, and how dare I? I mean, how, how could I stand in the presence of God being the way I now recognize that I am? Um, that, that act of perceiving God at a, at a higher level than we usually do is extremely humbling, uh, and when you compare even the, uh, the, the the glory of our prophets to the glory of God, it, it makes even the greatest prophet look like the uh, the worst of uh, of humanity, and and that's what the uh, what about Isaiah is referring to here, and that's what many people refer to of you know I've I've seen God, I've understood God, and when I do that, I realize how worthless I am, and therefore I mean I, I should just be dead in comparison. Uh, obviously that's not the God, way God works, and God's not looking to kill the people, but it's a self-reflection of, uh, of comparison of worth when we have that experience. Um, and uh, the phrase there for un unclean lips, I mean, it, it's it's not just uh, the words that he's spoken, is it? I mean, because we were going to find out later on that, you know, something happens to his lips, that it's kind of an atonement. So I, I, have, to, I have to think that, that that's a that's a picture of a of a bigger thing. Uh, well, you know, Isaiah lived um, in a time. Well, really, all the prophets did um, when the community wasn't always um, didn't always have a good track record. In fact, it very rarely had a good track record. Um, they they often um, were worshiping idols uh, and other gods and um, the names of these other gods would be on their lips. Um, they were often 
engaged in um, immoral business practices and, uh, and other activities, which again, they would be cheating and lying or swearing false oaths. And I, I think Isaiah, again, is recognizing even if he himself um, was not so bad, he is saturated in an environment that is. And how then can he bring back the, the, the record of what he is experiencing? How can he transmit it? How could his lips now carry these words when they have carried such other cargo? Um, and, and how will this work when he tries to, uh, to share these words with his people? Um, and yet, that's the situation he's in. Uh, that, that's where he's been put. Um, and it's really, you know, a, a very poignant uh, reflection upon himself and his community when he realizes how far off the mark they've been uh, up to this point and, and how important it is to uh, make a new change, which is what's going to happen in 6 and 7. <laughs> Then one of the seraphs flew over to me with a live coal, which he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched it to my lips and declared, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt shall depart and your sin be purged away. Uh, a live coal is, uh, is a red coal, right? I know a lot of people probably went through their whole lives and have never seen a coal before. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, a live coal is like a super hot burning coal. It would like cauterize the skin as soon as I touched it. Exactly. Uh, a red hot ember. One question that immediately springs to mind, um, and I, I, we see this a lot through Genesis when um, people have an interaction with an angel. The angel that's saying this, I'm going to assume, isn't the person who is taking away the, gin, the, the sin, or sorry, isn't who is taking away the guilt or purging the sin. The, these, this is um, it's, it's got to be God's words, isn't it? I mean, you can't, you can't have an angel flying around doing this. <laughs> so, um, it, it's a very good point. In fact, if you, uh, I'm sure you can edit out the pause here. If you give me a second, we um, we just did a program this last Sunday on prophecy, and it ha it happened that as we were doing that, um, one of the quotes that I shared with the uh, the, the congregation here was exactly on this point. From, uh, from the Guide for the Perplexed. And in it, and, and for those of you that would like to, uh, to look it up, this is in the, uh, the second book of the Guide for the Perplexed, of the second volume, um, and it's uh, chapter 41. And he talks about the fact that all prophets see God through a dream or a vision. All right, that's going back to what we described before, where there isn't an actual event happening here. This is a dream, this is a vision. Um, but he says that Sometimes the prophet will say that he heard the words of an angel in a dream or a vision. But sometimes the prophet will simply say that he heard the words of an angel and doesn't mention the dream or vision part because he assumes that the reader knows that's how all prophecy happens, so why should he bother telling you? Uh, he also argues, Rambam, that sometimes the prophet doesn't mention the angel and just says that God spoke in a dream or a vision. Because, after all, the angel is not really choosing to do anything. The angel is merely a projection of God's will. So if he cuts out mentioning the angel and mentions God, it's just getting to the point more directly, even though, yes, it wasn't a direct action of God in the sense that God could touch him or an angel could touch him. There, there was an intermediary layer of uh, interpretation that was happening. And then Rambam points out sometimes the prophet will simply say, God talk to me, and doesn't talk about an angel, doesn't talk about a dream or vision at all, but all of those should be assumed in all cases, that there is always some level of intermediacy um, happening, and that there is always a, um, a, a vision that is at the core that's happening, even if it's not being mentioned uh, directly. So, so what we see right here is that, you know, yes, it is an angel who is touching his lips, but when the angel speaks, it is God's words. And any efficacy of this angel's action is God's will, not, not the angel's. I, uh, I look at it like, uh, like we, have a, we have a friend in Australia who sent us some handmade soap today. And although she sent us the soap, she didn't actually bring the soap. Someone else brought the soap. I took the soap. Um, 
but that, that's kind of how it works here, right? The, the angels are, I mean, if you look at, I think Amal, Amalek is um, translated as messenger many times as well. Correct. Um, well, I mean, that is what the word means. It's just when it's a messenger of God, it's a slightly different um, status than when it's just a regular person's messenger. Um, maybe another parallel might also be, um, for those people who are in the United States, if the president gives a pardon to a criminal, um, he doesn't usually go and open up the, the jail door himself. Uh, there's usually someone else with that key. Uh, that doesn't mean that the jailer pardoned the criminal. It was still the president who did the pardon, but someone else was opening the door. Very good. You were once better. Okay. <laughs> Yours was more personal, though. <laughs> then I heard the voice of my Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? All right, so we have to stop there. When God says us, he is speaking about his royal majesty. The, uh, oh, this is obviously a conversation which with the circles I hang out in. Uh, <laughs> comes up a lot. I'm, I'm often, although Queen Victoria never said this, She's the, the phrase that's most attributed to Queen Victoria is "We are not amused." Yeah, that doesn't mean that there were more than one of her saying it. <laughs> um, so, um, can you give us, you know, in a nutshell, um, how this plural word is often so often used um, from God's own lips? Um, well, it's what's called the majestic plural, uh, or the the royal we uh, in in common English. And it is well attested throughout the, um, the biblical text that oftentimes the plural will be used in a, a singular way. Throughout the, the, the text, despite using a plural uh, or collective noun, um, the, the singular verb is the, the, the part that goes with it. Um, for, for those of you who uh, are listening and don't know um, a great deal about Hebrew, you have subject-verb agreement in Hebrew just like you do in English. Um, except the difference between plural and singular is much more obvious. And even though God may occasionally speak um, about God's self in a plural um, noun, the verb is still a single verb. And if we were talking about a group that was doing something, then the verb would also be a group. Um, so it really it's just meant to be a, uh, an intensifier, a, a majestic um, idiomatic expression. Um, we could even argue whether or not it needs to be translated into English as an us. Um, certainly in other languages that lacked a royal um, we, I, I think it would probably be misleading to translate it as an us. Uh, on the other hand, I, I'm also partial to semi-literal um, translations, so it, it's hard to know which way the, the translator should have gone with that. Um, I remember having a conversation before um it's quite interesting in the little bits of Hebrew that I've dabbled in. When we read about a plague of frogs in the Hebrew, it says a plague of frog. Yes. I, I thought that was well, really... Well, actually a frog came up, right. Mm -hmm. But then in English, we have sheep. So it all works out. You know, one sheep is a many sheep. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go say to that people. Hear indeed, but do not understand. See indeed, but do not grasp. Dull that people's mind, stop its ears, and seal its eyes, lest seeing with its eyes and hearing with its ears, it also grasp with its mind and repent and save itself. Well, but you have to read this very, very um, carefully. Notice where the, the quotes go, at least in the English. Obviously, there are no quote marks in the Hebrew, but God is telling Isaiah to go and tell the people that they should hear and not understand, that they should see but not grasp, that the, the people's minds should be dull. If you were to tell someone, no, 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 you go on, you, you, you stay stupid, right? Just keep going the way you're going because, God forbid, you should actually recognize what you're doing and change your ways, right? That's what Isaiah is saying to the people. This is not just God describing that the people shouldn't repent. He's saying, speak to the people in this way, hoping that they will repent, but God knows that they're not actually going to do so. So it's spoken almost ironically um, to, to the people. And if the people had sense, they would get 
this message loud and clear and they would have changed. It's not as though God was preventing them from changing. God was merely voicing God's um, knowledge that they were not going to. And, and so they would be told, look, I'm going to tell you this anyway, but you guys are too blind and deaf to get this point. And uh, he asks... He asks God, how long, my Lord, I assume, how long shall I give this message? And uh, God replies, until the towns lie waste without inhabitants, and houses without people, and the ground lies waste and desolate, for the Lord will banish the population, and deserted sites are many in the midst of the land. So kind of till there's no one else to say it to, right? Well, that's certainly what it's going to seem like uh, until we get to verse 13. Um, that basically you are going to be talking to your blue in the face and until the people have been swept away by the consequences of their corruption. Um, and then you can stop um, with that message. Then you can stop with the message of um, change and, and listen and come on people. Um, that's going to eventually stop. But... And then verse 13 comes in very, very importantly and, and begins to introduce uh, what the next step in the, uh, the history of the people will be. That Isaiah's message is not all um, doom and gloom and inevitable destruction, but it, it carries with it the seeds of, of redemption, um, which is what 13 and then the selections from 7 and 9 are going to bring. But while the tenth part yet remains, it shall repent. It shall be ravaged like a terebinth and the oak, of which stumps are left even when they are felled. Its stump shall be a holy seed. There are instances, aren't there, of course, where um, trees get chopped down, um, but the root of the tree is still viable, and uh, small parts grow back. Is that giving an allusion to that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is a, uh, a natural phenomenon that anyone who lives um, close to the natural world, which would have been everyone in the ancient world, uh, would have recognized immediately that even though you cut down the tree or you see a tree that was cut down, there is still life growing from it. And, and that was a very powerful metaphor. Well, it should remain a very powerful metaphor to us. Um, and, and that's exactly what God is promising here. He's like, yes, I know it's depressing. I know it's sad. I know it seems pointless. But you need to keep talking because there will be a, a, a remnant that will, that will be there. And they will hear this message, and they will hear, need the message of hope that you are about to give so that they can become restored. Okay, uh, so we are now in Chapter 7. Ahaz is kind of um, worried, right, that he's about to be decimated and wiped out? Absolutely. That was a, a rather constant fear. The, the southern kingdom, um, as opposed to the northern kingdom of Israel, was, was often very precarious. Uh, it was the, the weaker of the two. And so the, the southern kings were, were often rightly concerned with the, the future of their, uh, their kingdom. Okay. So in the reign of Ahaz, son of Yotam, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and king Pekah, son of Remaliah of Israel, marched upon Jerusalem to attack it. But they were not able to attack it. It's, well, it's an, it's an alliance between the, the northern kingdom um, and, the, uh, and, and Aram, uh, which were often our, our foes. Now, when it was reported to the house of David that Aram had allied itself with Ephraim, the hearts and the hearts of the people trembled as trees of the forest sway before the wind. But the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son, Shear Yeshuv, to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool by the road of the fuller's field. Say to him, be firm and calm, do not be afraid, and do not lose heart on account of those two smoking stubs of firebrands, on account of the raging of Rezin and his Arameans and the son of Remaliah. Smoking stubs of firebrands. Firebrand, is it like a poker? Uh, it's just a, um, um, a, a stick that's burning at one end. Because the Arameans with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have plotted against you, saying, We will march against Judah, invade and conquer it, and we will set up as king in it the son of Tabiel. Uh, Tabiel. 
I would say. But, you know, the idea here is that they are smoking stubs of a fire ban, which means they may be making a lot of noise, but they are pretty much burnt out. So you don't really need to be afraid. And then uh, we skip a little bit, go back and read those bits, they're very important, but we are jumping to um, chapter 9, and we're starting from verse 5. <clears throat> For a child has been born to us, the context is very important in this. <laughs> so I want people to, um, if you are uh, listening and uh, you're uh, a Christian, then um, just the tense and everything is super important. I, I remember reading this um, in a Christian translation. It will say, for a child will be born to us. It's utterly different. So just worth mentioning. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and authority has settled on his shoulders. He has been named. The mighty God is planning grace. The eternal father, a peaceable ruler. In token of abundant authority and of peace without limit upon David's throne and kingdom, that it may be firmly established in justice and in equity, now and evermore, the seal of the Lord of hosts shall bring this to pass. It's awesome, that bit. Um, before we talk about who that is speaking about, <laughs> because um, I'd be, uh, obviously we're going to go there, this is a very specific child, isn't it, of a very specific parent. Um, can we maybe um, just quickly talk about why this child is important? W why... Um, why was the child important to the person that the message was given to? So we've we've because that's kind of missed that out of the text. Yes, one of one of the uh, the joys of um, uh, of the way that the Haftarahs can work is it is so focused on the the context that is being woven around the Torah portion that oftentimes it just sort of assumes that you know everything else. And, you know, of course, I mean, don't you know the rest of what's being described here? Uh, haven't, you, uh, haven't you already memorized it? And that, that when you're sitting in the sanctuary and you're, you're reading through the, uh, the, the Fumash, which is the, uh, the book that has a compilation of the Torah readings and the, uh, the, the, the Haftarot that, that we're discussing, it, it can often feel really, really frustrating that they don't give the, uh, the, the rest of the, the context. But, um, but no, this is a prophecy that's being given to the, the king of Judah um, about the continuation of his line and about the, the security of his kingdom. Um, and really the whole description here is that the, the, the kingdom of Judah has not, um, what's the right word? Has, not become, has not reached its end. It's not a spent force. The, the kingdom of Judah will live on, and not only will it live on, but its best days are ahead of it, or at least better days are ahead of it. And there will be a child born that will grow into be a good king that will really restore Judah to a much stronger place. And more importantly, we now know from having read the end of the book, um, this, this kid, when he becomes king, is going to prevent the destruction of Judah that will overtake the northern kingdom. You can't overestimate how surprising the destruction of the north and the salvation of the south was um, during the Assyrian invasion that happened during the, uh, the kid's lifetime. Uh, the north was much stronger. It had more powerful allies. The, the north had everything going for it. Uh, and the south really was doing all right, but never great. And so when the Assyrians attacked, everyone assumed the north maybe would be able to survive. But if the North couldn't survive, then the South didn't have a chance. And, and so when this kid grows up to be king and is able to withstand the assault, um, it is considered miraculous. He, he delivers, he rescues, he saves the, uh, the Southern nation. Um, and, and the fact that he was also a righteous person and, and consistently followed God uh, was, was also quite surprising since the, 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 the kings didn't have such a great track record of that either. And of course, you know, spoiler alert, uh, this is generally believed to be felt by, by both Jewish scholars as well as most um, biblical scholars, um, secular scholars, to be referring to Hezekiah, um, the, the, who will become king next, and who does lead the people and lead the southern kingdom 
um, for the most part, very well. We get a little hint of that, don't we, in the in the first portion that speaks about his titles, um, the Mighty God. Is that it could be a reference to his name? Uh, yes, yes, from from the word Chazak, meaning um, strength, and he is um, definitely supposed to uh, to represent that. Well, you know, um, what's what's interesting is that although um, this is a, a fascinating chapter, the the Jewish consensus is that these prophecies regarding this child, regarding this redemption, have all been fulfilled. So they are historically interesting. They are interesting because they prove God's um, saving power um, in, in the physical world, in the historical tapestry of our people. Um, and therefore, the other prophecies that come for future redemption are, are taken all the more seriously. That because God did send a child that grew to be a king that was able to deliver the people in the time of Hezekiah during the Assyrian assault, um, we should believe the other prophecies, um, although they are slightly more um, long-term, that when God talks about the ultimate redemption of not just Israel but the world, that so too that will also come true. Um, but we don't dwell on it that much because this was finished. Um, I mean, it, it's like I said, it's inspiring, it's spiritually uplifting, but the prophecies for the Mashiach, for the actual Messiah, are, are much more interesting to us because those are the ones we're still waiting for the fulfillment. So they're 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 more open ended. This one you can put a fork in it. It's done, and um, and we know it's done because the 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 events which happened after this have have already begun. So we can we can tie it off neatly. Right. I mean, the rest of the book of Isaiah shows the fulfillment of this prophecy, um, which should be immensely gratifying um, to us. There we go, everyone. Thank you. That was uh, this week's show. Uh, thank you, Joshua Neely, for joining us again. Oh, thank you, Jason. My pleasure. Uh, you can find the uh, passage we'll be talking about next week by hanging around till the end of the video. Uh, please like and subscribe uh, to this channel and uh, share this with your friends on Facebook. Leave comments and questions underneath, and we'll see you all again next week. Bye-bye.